Oh, I'm from New York. Uh, and then in one hour's time, we have a second talk by Andrew Stewart from Caltech. Uh, just to, as a reminder for, the, for those of you who are, are new to this format, um, we encourage people to ask questions in the chat during the talk um, and if possible to answer each other's questions. Uh, and if a question hasn't been answered, uh, then I will interrupt the speaker and, and ask them to clarify. Um, otherwise, for, um, for more general questions at the end of the session, uh, people have an opportunity to, to raise their hands and uh, ask questions. Okay, so um, I think without any further delay, um, should we start with uh, Louis-Pierre Arguin talking about large values of the Riemann zeta function in short intervals. All right, thank you, Amanda. And uh, well, thanks for the invitation. And uh, also I want to thank Life and Andres for, uh, for this idea, this initiative of this seminar. I think it's a great idea and I hope it's, uh, it's, uh, it stays, it's there to remain. Um, all right, so at any time, Amanda, if there's a problem, just let me know. And um, what we're going to talk about today, the Riemann zeta function, especially the large values in, in, in short intervals. And that's joint work with uh, Paul Bourget that is in the chat right now. If there's a question, he can answer them. Uh, Frédéric Wiemann, Caltech, and Maxim Radzivin, and also uh, a work uh, with David Bellius and uh, uh, Kenan Sandorera, John. All right, so uh, let's do this. So here's the Riemann zeta function. Okay, just a little primer. Uh, so the Riemann zeta function, when the real part of S is bigger than one, is just the sum of one over uh, n to the power S. And that converges, of course, if the real part of S is uh, bigger than one. And you can express that by using the fact that n uh, you can write the prime decomposition of M. You can write it as a product, an Euler product over all the primes P. So in this talk, P is always a prime, one minus P minus S to the minus one, okay? And so that was actually uh, studied by Euler first, and what uh, Riemann did was extend this to the whole complex plane. Now we know what the Riemann uh, zeta function is in that part of the complex plane. And then there's a nice functional equation here that relates that to the negative part where the real part of S is smaller than zero. And what's left to understand is this critical strip where the non-trivial zeros of zeta should lie. So the trivial zeros are the ones for which this uh, coefficient chi is zero. And that turns out all the tri trivial zeros are the negative uh, even integers, okay? So those are the trivial zeros and the non-trivial zeros are in the strip and the Riemann hypothesis tells you they should be on the critical line where the real part of S is um, equals to one half. So we'll actually work on this critical line. So when I say short interval, I mean short interval of the critical line. All right, there's only one pole for the zeta function. It's uh, at S is equal to one and you get the harmonic series. Okay, now how does this look like, this function on the critical line? So we're gonna look in this talk, uh, uh, look at the modulus, okay? Not the phase, but the modulus. And you expect that this is gonna oscillate a lot just because, well, every integer, if S is complex, right, you're gonna get oscillatory behavior. And so if you plot it in Mathematica, that's what the modulus looks like on the critical line, okay? So very oscillatory function, as you can see. And um, that's gonna be uh, our object of study, okay? Now we're interested in the large values, so you can look at the global maximum or the large values on very large intervals. So this envelopes here, okay? That's very, very hard question. Or you could look at large values in the small intervals. So locally, you look at these functions in a short interval locally, you pick your interval, and then you might have a chance to say something 
because as a probabilist, you see this oscillatory behavior and there should be some sort of uh, probabilistic uh, tools to handle this uh, oscillatory uh, behavior, okay? All right, so that's actually gonna be, if you want, our sample space from a probabilistic uh, perspective, okay? So that's our playground, if you wish, for today. All right, so it's fun to actually uh, look at very hard question, okay? So the Lindelof hypothesis, which is actually a bit weaker than, which is weaker than the Riemann hypothesis, tells you that the maximum of zeta on a large interval, so large for me means an interval big T to T, where think of T as going to infinity, okay, very large. Then this tells you that the envelope I, will, I was looking at uh, grows slower than any power of t, okay? Which, so that's, that's what we're looking at. This grows slower than any power of t. Now the Riemann hypothesis implies something stronger, that is replace this epsilon by one over log log t. So that goes to zero. Uh, this should not be this here, all right? Okay, now um, another interesting conjecture just to, so obviously these are widely open. So I joke with my students, if you solve the Riemann hypothesis, maybe your first page of the New York Times. If you solve the Lindelof hypothesis, maybe first page of the science section. These are really, really uh, hard questions. The moment conjectures is interesting. Uh, it's also extremely hard. Uh, and it's looking at those large values on large intervals. So you see here that I average over my large interval T to T. So you'll see that sometimes I will write expectation for that integral average over, um, so that's a probability measure obviously. So one over T, T to T. And this tells you that if I look at zeta, so I look at the beta moment of zeta on that large interval, I average, okay? So this obviously access the large values of, uh, of the zeta function. This grows like a constant, which is predicted by random matrix theory. It's a nice uh, prediction by Keating and Snaith. Grows like log t to the b to square over four, okay? And you might ask, how does that relate to the previous results? Well, essentially the Lindelof hypothesis is uh, you can express it in terms of the moments and it tells you that the moments for any beta grows slower than t to the epsilon. So you see the gap, right? So it's expected that the moments grows like log t to some power and the Lindelof hypothesis just tell you that uniformly in beta, right? It grows smaller, uh, it's slower than the power power of uh, t, okay? So it's log, so you, you, you're off by a log t, okay? So it's much more precise. Okay, now let's look at it, this from a probabilistic perspective. So we have moments, so we might expect we can do some probability. Now, if I look at the moment conjecture here, right? I can see it as a moment generating function of what, okay, so I'm gonna write this more like exponential of beta log of the modulus, okay? Okay, so then this is the moment generating function of the random variable log zeta, okay, for a point that is picked uniformly in the interval t to t, okay? So that point I'm gonna call tau, okay? So tau is a uniform uh, between t to t. So what I have here is really just the expectation of beta log zeta one half. So let me actually, since I have these fancy tools now, I can correct as I go, okay? So that's actually the only, 
okay, source of randomness in everything I'm gonna say. And so what we're doing, see, right, is picking a tau uniformly on this, on the large interval, okay? And asking how the value fluctuate as I pick that tau. And the moment conjecture tells you the ex, uh, moment generating function of that uh, random variable. And it tells you that this moment generating function is quadratic in beta. And therefore it should behave like a Gaussian, okay? So if you do a little calculation, it's actually a Gaussian with variance one half log log t and mean zero. Okay, so we already learned something that a typical point of log zeta in that sample space has Gaussian fluctuation with variance one half log log t and therefore the typical values is square root of one half log log t. Okay, so essentially it's square root of log log t. So that you can put, uh, this you can uh, put on firm grounds and that's the Selberg central limit theorem that tells you the log of, of zeta divided by square root of that variance converges to normal zero one. This value one half log log t will come back in the talk. That's very important. And sometimes we'll call it the Selberg variance, okay? Now this is about typical values. The moment generating function is much stronger because it's about, you know, you, you can actually access large deviations, okay? And um, so it's stronger. And so what is known for the moment conjecture, I'm, I'm gonna use some results. Um, so without the Riemann hypothesis, uh, you actually have a form of the, of this, of the moments for beta equals zero, two, and four with the right constant. So zero is obvious, two goes back to Hardy Littlewood and, and four to Hingham. So that's kind of classical result. And uh, more recently, uh, we have a sharp upper bound. By a sharp, I mean the exponent b squared over four for beta smaller or equal to four. That's the result of Heap, uh, Redzeville, and Sander or Rajan. And also sharp lower bound, that means the right exponent for beta small, bigger than equal to two. Now the Riemann hypothesis helps you Okay, and you get sharp upper bound and lower bound for all beta, and for the upper bound, that's a result of sound and also Harper. Okay, so, all right, so the Riemann hypothesis is useful to get a large deviation. All right, so those are very hard questions, as I was saying. So, how can you reduce the problem to answer something? Well, uh, we're going to look at short intervals. So we're still going to have that tau. So I pick a point uniformly on the, in, on the large interval t to t. And then what we're going to do is look around that point. How does the function behave? Okay. And then you hope that maybe you can increase the interval. So change the size of the interval to get uh, you know, more information about large values. Okay, so that's the idea and that's, uh, so if you zoom around a tau, so let's say that's my tau somewhere in the middle. So I look locally, so that's actually a picture of log zeta. So the zeros are sent to minus infinity. Um, this is how it looks like. So you see that the oscillatory behavior is still there, uh, but uh, you start picking up some smoothness and that smoothness, uh, as uh, I'll mention, so what's the scale uh, of the width uh, of these peaks? It's essentially one over uh, log of t, which is the size between the zeros. We'll get back to that. Okay, so there's some, we pick up some smoothness and what we're interested in is the large value. So this guy, all right, good, okay. So this idea of looking at short intervals in a, for typical intervals, by typical, I mean, I pick that tau, um, goes back to a Fyodorov Harry Keating uh, 2012. And here's the conjecture. So if you pick that uh, point uniformly on the large interval, then as T becomes large, the maximum goes like log T, that's the uh, leading order, divided by double log T, to the power three quarter. And then after that, the fluctuations after that are actually of order one. 
okay? So this mt is actually a random variable that depends on, on tau. Tau is the only source of randomness. And what I mean by fluctuations are of order one, in fact, these converges supposedly in distribution to a random variable m, and that random variable has a right tail, which goes like y e to the minus two y. Okay, so you see that this is much smaller than uh, what you would expect, say, from, from, from uh, Lindelof or the Riemann hypothesis. So we were, uh, it's, it goes like log t. Um, and it's surprising for uh, many reasons, but uh, first of all, it's very precise. Second of all, it's different than what uh, you would uh, expect if uh, the points here were independent with the Selberg variance one half log log t, okay? What you would expect is actually a one quarter instead of a three quarter. And instead of having this tail behavior for the fluctuation, you should get a tail behavior, which is exponential, um, that what you have for a gumball distribution. Okay, so the difference between the two actually comes from the fact that uh, you pick up correlations, okay? So there are correlations locally between two points of the zeta function. And these correlations actually log, uh, log correlated, so they decay logarithmically with the distance. And that was one of the reason why uh, they, uh, they, come up, they came up with this conjecture looking at the log correlations. All right, okay. And that's what I want to explain. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the theorems and talk about uh, why do we see uh, a log correlated process locally in Zeta. And in fact, this log correlated process is very close to branching random walk. And I'm sure there's some uh, specialists in the audience uh, and for branching random walk, that's exactly what you would expect. So this three instead of a one, okay? And this still behavior. Okay, so that's what I wanna explain in the uh, second half. So first, uh, I will uh, talk about what uh, we can prove and what, what can be proved. All right, so, so all the statements here are about the probability that the maximum is bigger than some V, okay? So we're looking at convergence and probability of that maximum. Okay, so what can be proved? So the leading order, which is this log t, so that was proved, uh, uh, so that means, okay, so that would prove by, by Nash Nudel and uh, our group of people, so that's Billius, Borgat, Radzivil, and Sound. Okay, so we, Nash Nudel used the Riemann hypothesis at one of his, um, uh, in, in actually the lower bound, we don't need to use the Riemann hypothesis, but uh, Nash Nudel also deals with the imaginary part of the log zeta, which is due to the log of the modulus of the real part. Okay, so now the level of precision is to leading order. That means that we allow a log t plus of minus epsilon, okay? And that means that this probability is O1 Okay, if you look at log t plus epsilon, and it's one minus little o1 for, so if you have plus epsilon, this probability is o1, little o of one, and minus epsilon, it's one minus little o of one, meaning that the maximum in a typical interval essentially is uh, with high prob probability between log t to the power one plus epsilon and log t one minus epsilon. Okay, so that's the leading order. Now, uh, Harper was able to go uh, a bit further to the second order doing the upper bound, okay? That means that if you plug in that V, so you see that I have the second order here. Now, since we're dealing with a lot of logs, uh, the iterated log to save some space 
I write log two, okay? So log two is log log for the rest of the talk. So tr log three is log log log, okay? And et cetera. So it was able essentially to get this. And then what plays the role of that plus minus epsilon there, this, this, the room you allow, okay, uh, for the error is essentially a power of log 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 t. <laughs> All right? That's for the upper bound. Now, uh, we have a recent result. It's not, uh, it should be online in the, hopefully by the end of June. So I'm sorry, Max, I think I screwed up your name here. Um, all right, so what we can do, go, do is go to order one for the upper bound, okay? So we can actually get this maximum for a typical in interval to order one. Okay, so that V now is what you expect and you get E to the Y now, okay? Nothing depends on V here. I mean, it could actually, you, we can take Y of order one or we can actually take a Y that depends on, on T, okay? So in probability, that would be exactly what you want if you want to prove tightness of the maximum, okay? So we prove the upper bound, that is the probability that the maximum is bigger than this e to the y, and we even get the right tail. It's smaller than y e to the minus 2y, okay? Um, all right, now this is, okay, so this probability p again, okay, is under tau uniform t to t, okay? But that, it's not, you know, it's good to remember that this probability, right, is just the average on an interval. So it actually says something about the whole zeta function because if I can write this probability as the Lebesgue measure divided by t, so you can express this result as saying that the Lebesgue measure of points where the maximum in a, 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 an interval of order one, all right, is uh, bigger than this precise uh the term uh, precise uh, level is smaller than big t y e to the minus 2y so you actually get uh, a bound also on you know how many intervals are typical okay good i think this is a good time to take questions i i, I put like a so i don't know if i have questions on the chat or or comments or everything good I think that's been very clear so far, so there's no questions yet. All right, okay. <laughs> How many people have logged out? I'm just joking. All right. We have Good. a couple of questions now. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. One person says in the previous slide, should tau be little t? Should tau be equal to? T that? in the previous slide. Oh, it's just that I express, you know, it's just that I express tau here. So this little t, right, now it's no longer random because I can just express this probability. It's really like the, when I do the expectation. Uh, so, so I'm really looking at, at, at the measure of the, of the t's in that interval where I have a, a, a large maximum. So, so, so that should be a, a T in that argument of zeta. Oh, 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 I see. Yes, yes, thank you. That's correct. This is okay. great because you can correct your typos as you go along. And one other question. Um, any information about the constant capital C? No. <laughs> that would be great, but no. It's already really hard to get this. It's really hard, and uh, maybe I can. Ex uh, so the thing is, in that C, uh, that C contains information about small primes, and that's really hard to to get because with small primes, you might not have the kind of averaging, so that uh, you would expect. So essentially, this y e to the minus two y comes from you know when you go far in the primes, then you start to, to see some, you know, probabilistic uh, phenomena. Uh, but for small primes, you still don't have this averaging. And so therefore, there's a lot of information there that is not probabilistic. 
I hope that answers the question. Okay, and one more question. Um, where, where does the branching under bulk come from? That's why I'm explaining in the second part. And one final question. Um, so your result gives uh, tightness to the right, but do you know anything about tightness to the left? That's, uh, that's to, uh, so that's the second paper that we're writing. So, <laughs> yes. So the, so, so the, the first paper that uh, should be online soon uh, handles uh, tightness to the right, tight, tightness to the, the left uh, it will be another paper. Yeah. But the techniques, so what I can say is the techniques that we have handles the, the, can handle the tightness to the left. I think I can say that safely. I hope that answers the questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there don't be any further questions. All right, I have another stopping point. So, <laughs> so you know, when it's written questions, that's my stopping point. I have another one coming. So, all right, so great to have questions. All right, okay. All right, so now we, uh, okay, so another actually, so I, I wanna also, uh, talk about, uh, so I'm gonna, so the interval so far, these results about interval of order one, right? So intervals of order one. So what about larger intervals? Um, so as, again, as I say, you look at tau and you can look at, maybe you wanna stretch, look, you know, your zoom, okay? You wanna zoom, you know, not that close. And, and, you know, if you're very optimistic, maybe you can handle super large interval and say something about very hard questions. So a first step uh, that we took with uh, Frédéric and Max, um, it turns out that you can handle any intervals which are a, a size of a power of log t, okay? Now, this exponent can also be negative minus one. That means that you look at super small interval like mesoscopic interval, okay? Now, what is one over log t? The barrier is because one over log t is essentially the distance between zeros and there, you know, it's very different, okay? So one, one over log t is really a structural barrier, okay? So these uh, branching walk techniques can handle log t to, to, some, to some power. And something interesting is that uh, uh, the maximum of log zeta, okay? So we can only do the leading order. Log, uh, so this is for log zeta, it's log log t, the leading order. Um, then instead of having one, so for theta equals to zero, that's interval of order one, then you get one if you want in front of log log t. So that's the power of log t if you just look at zeta. Then the power changes. For theta negative, it's one plus theta. And for theta positive, it's square root of one plus theta. And I should say that this is conditional on the Riemann hypothesis for theta is bigger than three, okay? Now, why do you have a difference between the behavior for large interval and small intervals? That's because of the branching random walk behavior and so that's going to enter the second part, okay? So that's a good excuse to talk about branching random walk. Now, the other thing, um, so you might ask, okay, what about the second order for large intervals? Okay, so if I take theta bigger or equal to zero. Now, for theta equals to zero, we know that its exponent should be three quarter. That's the branching random walk. Now, if theta is bigger than zero, what you should have is essentially what you get for Gumbel. So this is the IID, so the, exp uh, the exponent is one quarter, and this just comes from uh, this power. So it's exactly like IID. It should be like that. So those are conjectures. And uh, with uh, Guillaume Zubac and Lisa Hartung, we have a, 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 another conjecture. What about you take theta goes to zero, okay? And if theta goes to zero, so you approach an interval of order one, then you get an interpolation between that three quarter and that one quarter, and that interpolation is actually uh, uh, depends on how you, uh, on alpha, and alpha tells you how you approach zero, all right? 
So I guess the, the point of this is to see that, you know, with those techniques, you have actually access to any intervals that are power of log t. Beyond that is very different. All right, so I let's talk about, yes. Um, which is why is theta equals three special? Uh, a good question. Uh, it's because, uh, I guess I won't do the calculation, but it's because what, ha what happens at beyond that is that uh, you will see from the proof, I'd, I'm gonna need a beta moment. And, and for theta bigger than three, that beta is bigger than four, and we don't have a good bound for, uh, uh, without the Riemann hypothesis for beta uh, larger than four. So, so th theta is equal to three, uh, means that uh, beta uh, equals uh, four, okay? There's a correspondence, it's gonna be clear in the next slide. And if you go beyond theta three, then you need beta moments of beyond four. And we only have an upper uh, a bounce for these moments um, uh, under the Riemann hypothesis. Going, going beyond uh, fourth moment for, for zeta is extremely, extremely hard. Okay, there's really something um, that is uh, not understood, I guess. All right. Uh, I, uh, that answers, I hope. All right, so how do we prove these things? So this is only sketches and give an idea, okay? So let's start with uh, uh, the first order of the maximum. I will only talk about upper bounds, okay? Lower bounds are slightly different. Okay. Uh, okay, so... What you want to do, uh, upper bounds, is like first moment, all right? First moment method. Now you have to do it a bit in a, in a clever way uh, for some cases. So, okay, so I said before that the distance between zeros is essentially one over log t. Uh, why is that? Is because uh, it's not too hard to show that the number of zeros is just complex analysis techniques, t to t. Okay, in the large intervals, I expect t zeros times log t, which means that on an interval of order one divided by t, I get log t zeros. So log t zeros in interval of order one. All right. So that means that I should have zeros every one over log t. Okay, so this is what the heuristics come from. So if I have an interval of uh, size log t to the power of theta, I expect if I wanna look at the maximum, I'm gonna look between zeros. So you expect that you are able to restrict the analysis to log t to the one plus theta points. Okay, so instead of looking the maximum on the continuum, you can restrict to log t to the one plus theta points. That's the heuristics. In reality, you have to work a little bit more, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, therefore, what you want to do is simply, okay, the probability that I have a point in my interval, okay, of order one, uh, sorry, of, of that order, such that log of zeta is bigger than b. So you do a union bound, okay, I get log t1 plus theta points, and I do a Markov inequality simply, okay, so I get e to the minus beta v, or turn enough, uh, the beta moments of zeta. And let's go back to the question. So the beta moments, we have upper bounds without the Riemann hypothesis up to beta equals to four. After that, you have the bound uh, with the right exponent for beta small, uh, for beta bigger than four. So, and then you just, uh, you know, optimize over beta. And this is where you see that this theta relates to the beta, right? And what you get is Gaussian tail because the moments are Gaussian, okay? So nothing really uh, surprising there. And therefore you see that square root one plus theta log log t plus some epsilon, some error is always an upper bound, okay? No matter what theta is. So, and that's actually supposed to be sharp for theta bigger and equal to zero. We can prove it actually. For theta smaller than zero, this is not sharp because it's supposed to be one plus theta, not square root. Okay, this is one, if theta is, is negative, one plus theta is smaller than the square root. And this is where correlations come from. Okay, 
Now let's talk about the branching random walk, okay? So that should take around 10 minutes. All right, so where, where is the branching random walk? Okay, so let's go back to, so let's go back to the first definition of Zeta as an Euler product. So this Euler product might not converge. So I'm working formally here, okay? Then take uh, the log of the modulus of that and expand the log. The leading order will then be the sum over primes P up to a certain truncation that we call X. The real part, because I look at the norm, P to the minus sigma minus I T, okay? All right. Now, this will hold with some error for a sigma between a zero and one, okay? And that error obviously depends on X. And as we will see, what you wanna do is stick X as close as possible to T, okay? Now, this is gonna be harder and harder, okay? And that's actually the main difficulty. So why T you'll see, it's related to the Selberg variance, okay? Now, this kind of decomposition, you can make, uh, you can make uh, rigorous, it's easier on the Riemann hypothesis, you control the error much better, okay? And if you work without the Riemann hypothesis, you use some modification techniques and you know, a lot of the difficulties are there, okay? So for us, let's just focus on the main term and assume also that sigma is equal to one half. For the upper bound, actually, we can always work directly on the critical axis, okay? Now, this is our candidate for the random walk, okay? So you see you have a sum, that's good. All right, so here's the random walk, okay? So I'm gonna sum over primes. Now, if I plug in, okay, here I wrote sigma plus i t, but in our case, we work with one half plus i tau plus i h, where h index the interval, right? So if I just plug in this in here, all right? What I get is um, I get this this term, okay? Now we remember our source of randomness, right? I'm talking about random walk. So where's the randomness? It's only in that tau, and that tau it's p to the i tau, or maybe a minus, and it's just a random phase, okay? So it's exponential minus i tau log p, okay? So these are Unif uh, th these are on the uh, unit circles, right? It's like a random phase. So you're summing random phases here, okay? All right, so you might think that your random walk, the increment of your random walk is at every P, okay? But that's wrong because the variance will depend on P, okay? So what you wanna take for the increment of your random walk is actually sum over P over a certain range of primes. There, those for which log p is between e to the l minus one to e to the l. And the reason for this is that if you actually take the second moment of that, and you can, right? Remember the tau, you know exactly what it is. It's a uniform on t2t. T. So you can take the expectation. What you get is one half, because of that real part, sum over one over p over that range, okay? And now you invoke the prime number theorem. That is, you know what is the density of the primes, essentially. It's uh, one over uh, log p, okay? So one over log x at x, uh, around x. So you can actually sum primes, okay? It's essentially like the integral of uh, uh, one over, uh, one over uh, x, one over log x. And so what you pick up is the log log, okay? So when you do log log, so I should say that, so uh, you, put, you get the log log over prime. So there's already a log in the P. And therefore a second log gives you between L and L minus one. So you pick up a variance, which is essentially one half. Okay, so that's important. So why do we sum over that range is to get a variance that is constant one half, okay? That's the increment of the walks, okay? 
Now, why are they, um, so now, why do I wanna go up to T? Well, if I look at my walk, that I will write SK. So my walk, I sum over L up to K. And so if I want this to have a variance one half log log T, I need to take K up to log log T, okay? So this is what uh, I was saying. So if X is equal to T, so I sum all the primes up to T, I take the log log of that, I get one half log log T, which is the variance that Salberg tells me is the right thing, okay? Now, you don't have to go up to one half log log t, okay? For the first order, it turns out that you can go up to exponential of power of log t, which is much smaller than t, okay? So I'll, uh, in my last slide, I'll tell you why it's problematic uh, to go to up to t, okay? And that's the main problem that you have to overcome to go to order one. So getting close to T is actually hard, and I can tell you why. Is that if you want to take higher moments of that, the error term here blows up. Okay. All right. So this is the the candidate for the random walk. The increments are sum over a slice of prime. Okay. Of this, and this term comes from formally expanding the Euler product. All right. So that's one random walk for one point H. Now what about several points, okay? So what happens if I do the correlation now, the covariance between two increments, okay? And you just do the calculation, what you're gonna have here is cosine of the distance between H and H prime log P, okay? And therefore, if H is equal to H prime, I get the sum of one over P like I had before, okay? But now you see that this will depends on the distance. Now, if what's inside is really close to zero, what happens here, the cosine is essentially one. And so the, ex, the increments are essentially correlated. And that's what I do in my little picture here. That's a branching random walk picture. Take two points, H and H prime, all right? Up to a certain prime, and that prime is exponential of the distance between the two to the minus one. These increment, these walks are essentially the same, okay? So the values of zeta, okay, the contribution are essentially the same for the two h and h prime. And then if the distance is bigger, if the cosine is bigger than one, this starts to oscillate. And therefore the covariance, if you do the calculation, is really small, it's close to zero, okay? And so you essentially have a decoupling after that prime, okay? All right, so there's a special prime again for two H, H prime where the walks starts to decouple, okay? Now that's in terms of the prime. Now, if you look at the increments, the increments are this K here, is essentially the log log scale of that, okay, the log log of the prime. So if you take the log log of that prime, you get logarithm of H minus H prime minus one. And that's why we say that this process, these walks are log correlated, which essentially means it's an approximate branching random walk, all right? So this is where the, 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 the branching comes from, okay? Um, this uh, behavior of, of the sum over primes for two different ages, okay? <clears throat> All right, so, okay. And so you have variance one half for each increment of the walk and the branching rate, if you think about it, should be E, okay? So it's an average branching rate. Why E? Well, I have log log T increments in my walk, essentially. All right, and I have log t points at the end, right? Because I told you that to capture the, the behavior, I just need to look between zeros and I have log t zeros. So I have log t points to look at. So if I take exponential of that, right? So it grows exponentially. So I should get log t points. All right, I have another stopping point, question, uh, questions, and I will explain 
I, I have three more slides that should be okay on time. Any questions? It looks like we haven't got any questions right now, so maybe All right. we'll hold them till the okay. end. Okay. All right. But good to know that uh, we're still online. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so with that picture in mind, we can at least understand some of the results, okay? So remember that if theta was negative, I had a different exponent for the behavior of the maximum. I had log t to the power one plus theta and not the square root, okay? So there was a, a difference between small interval and big interval. And where does that come from? And simply that picture that I, I, I copied, so if you look at a small interval, smaller than order one, okay, then all the points here, each of those points have a, are, have a random walk and those random walk are correlated. And they're correlated up to a special prime, right? Which depends on the distance, this h minus h prime. Now plug in log t to the power theta. If theta is negative, so it's minus theta becomes positive. And so therefore up to that prime, which in the log log scale is theta log log t. So that's the Q1 up to that increment. This is the same walk. So the union bound is stupid, right? It's only one walk. So that walk only contributes square root of its variance, which is much smaller. So what you have to do is do the union bound of the rest of the walks, okay, where you have independence. And there, the variance is no longer the whole walk I should consider. The effective variance is the remaining. So it's one plus theta log log t. That's what I'm saying here, okay? And once you have that, you do your union bound and you subtract the common part because I don't care. You do a Markov as before. And now you get a beta moment with zeta and exponential of minus the common part. Turns out you can do that moment too, okay? It's called a twisted moment. So you can evaluate that and you get a Gaussian tail as before, but the difference is the variance now is one plus theta. So to actually get that to little o of one, I have to plug in one plus theta here, okay? So that explains the behavior, just the branching structure, even at linear order matters for small intervals. All right, so I have just two more slides and I have 10 minutes, so I think in five minutes I can wrap it up. Now, what's the difficulty when you want to go to error of order one? And that's uh, what we did with Max and Paul. So the main difficulty I told you is you want to push X, okay, up to T, that tru truncation of the walk, okay? I want to push it up to T. Why? Well, at order one, if I take the log log of that, I get one minus epsilon log log t. And at leading order, I can play with that epsilon and not lose anything. But I cannot do that anymore because I want to go to order one. So I want this thing as close as possible to, to, to t, okay? So that walk, the increments have to go very close to t. Now, what's the problem to do that? Essentially is that when I look at my walk, and I want to take large moments because I want to do large deviation. And essentially you have to go to moments of order log log T. It turns out that the moments of that walk are Gaussian moments, okay? So that walk that we have is very close to Gaussian, okay? It's a bit like a sum of ID, so you have some Gaussian behavior. However, you have an error. It's the price to pay, not everything is perfectly Gaussian. And if you look at the error you have here, which depends on that exponent, do a little calculation, you run into trouble when you look at increments that are really close to log log t. In other words, when the primes, okay, so that's the log log scale, but when primes are close to t. And so you can go up to there without any problem, but there's a threshold here. And that threshold is exactly when you start to see second order. So there's no problem to actually do the second order to some error, okay? So you can do large deviations, large moments, but beyond that, you want to actually uh, do something different to handle that error, okay? And that's my last slide, it's a picture. So let me just uh, 
explain what we do. It's some sort of iterative scheme. And for those of you who uh, have worked on branching random walk, you will recall some, some of, of the ingredients, but we have some, some new ones. So what happens here is that, all right, so you want to show that no points can reach a really high level. So here for notational purpose, I write n for log log t, okay? So you want to push your walk up to n, okay? And you want to rule out all points reaching n to the minus three quarter log n plus something of order one, okay? So that's the order of the maximum. And you approximately have log t walks or e to the n walks, okay? So it's a branching random walk with branching rate e to the n. So how can you rule out all these walks, right? So the idea that goes back to Bramson is, well, where does this three quarter comes from? Where branching random walk is self-similar, right? I know the maximum is linear in the number of increments at first order, right? So I have log log t increments. So at first order, the it's linear in the number of increments. And since it's self-similar, at every k, all right, the maximum shouldn't be too much too, too, uh, too much above this k, all right? Now, there's some correction here, but that's just to get the second order. But essentially, what you have is that the maximum at every k should not be above some linear barrier with some space over to, to do the analysis, okay? All right, now here's the problem here, if you wanna run that argument, is that you wanna construct that barrier, right? But in our case, we cannot do large deviation, I told you, right? So you, the problem is if you have a point at some k here, you, you wanna rule out the walks that are really low and then shoots up and, uh, and touch the barrier, right? So I wanna rule that out but I cannot rule it out because I don't have large deviation, okay? So our ingredient is to include a lower barrier, okay? So the lower barrier appeared a bit before when dealing with the geomet genealogy of branching brand motion. Uh, so what we do here, we construct it a priori, okay? So that lower barrier allows you to rule out the points that are too low, and therefore, the only thing you have to deal with are walks at every k that are in between an upper and a lower barrier. And it's much easier in that window to control the large deviations because you don't have big jumps. So you don't have points coming from below to touch the barrier. They're all within that, that uh, barrier, okay? And you want, what we do is we construct that upper and lower barrier it, uh, in iteration, okay? And so both of them in iteration. And doing that, we iterating, so you start, you know, uh, so you wanna get closer, closer to log log t, so you construct that barrier as you go. All right? And uh, it starts being like much harder when you get close to t, so we start at n minus log n, so really close to, to n. But then after that, you have to construct it up to n minus log log n, then n minus log 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 n, and et cetera. So it's a finite induction. You just have to do that a finite time, and you get uh, to this. So it's constructing this barrier in iteration. Uh, all right, I think that's what I wanted to say. I still have five minutes, so thank you very much. I'm happy there was no glitch. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so if people want to ask questions, there are two ways to do it. Either if you write something in the chat, uh, then I'll read it out, uh, or you should be able to raise your hand, uh, in which case we can unmute you um, and you can ask your question uh, verbally. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please, please make yourself known. Ah, Nathaniel has a question. Um, let me just try and unmute him. Um, uh, 
Uh, Nathaniel, you're unmuted now, I believe. Yeah, hi. I was wondering if you had a, a, maybe a heuristic explanation for why the, the tail is much higher in this case than you would expect if you do a comparison with matching random walk. Uh, which tail? The right tail? Yeah, the y e to the minus two y as a. Uh, is that this is oh. what you expect from this is what you oh, expect. This is exactly actually. what you'd expect from this is exactly what you expect. Yeah. That would be nice to have something different actually. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. It's it's exactly uh exactly what you expect. Maybe I should uh, take this as an excuse to uh so so okay, so we can handle y of order one and also y can depends on t, okay? And you know, y can depends on t like can be really, really big. But the problem is if you take y really big, this is no longer sharp, okay? This is supposed to be sharp for y of order one and up to log log t, okay? But obviously it would be great because you see what I have here, you know, what you want is have access to the super large values that you see in the Lindelof hypothesis and all that. But this is not sharp enough to get anything interesting. I see. Thanks. So, sorry, I missed that. This is no, no, thanks for the question. Okay, and I think you have another question, which is maybe along similar lines. Um, can you get asymptotics for the right tail? Uh, these are the asymptotics. I'm not sure I understand the question. This is this is asymptotic. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, let me, I've unmuted. Um, yeah. I've unmuted Max Williams so he can uh, maybe say for himself. Um, uh, maybe uh, matching, oh. matching upper and lower bound. So. Yeah, so the matching lower bound. So, the, okay. The, to, uh, so, as I was saying, the matching lower bound, we're working on it, but the this, uh, so the, our paper that will be uh, posted uh, in the next, uh, hopefully before the end of June, the next few weeks, that, that does the upper bound. The lower bound is actually a bit simpler uh, and uh, we would have matching asymptotics, yes. Okay, thank you. The, the same techniques with the upper lower bear works. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Is there anyone I've, I've missed? I can't see anyone else with their hands raised. Um, I think in that case, maybe we should all, um, I'll unmute everybody and we can all uh, give it. <laughs> Okay, so we'll start again in a couple of minutes time uh, with Andrew Stewart. Amanda, would you like me to screen share or not yet? Uh, yes, please, please screen share now. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, it's good if, it's good that I can see you because that's my check that the connection is working, so it's good. It's good that a couple of people are not without the deer. Yes, I'll stay visible for the whole talk. Thanks. Hey, Andrew. Is that now visible? Yes, that's great, yeah. So numbers are still um, changing, so I'll wait until the numbers um, of participants stabilize and then, uh, and then introduce you. So I'll give it another minute, I think, just till. Um, that's good, and uh, how's the sound? Perfect. Thank you. I can hear you well, Andrew, as well, and hello. Thank you, hi. Thanks for speaking as well. Pleasure. Keep moving so that I know that I haven't lost the connection. It is an Ethernet connection, so it should be okay, but you never know. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Wolfgang.
Okay, I think um, numbers seem to be stabilizing now. So um, perhaps I'll introduce uh, Andrew Stewart from Caltech, uh, who is going to be speaking.